21-year-old devoted student was just a few months away from graduating college when tragedy struck on the 7th of January, 1978. She'd been found raped and strangled in her college apartment, and her family was kept in the dark for decades as they had no answers to who would want to hurt her. Finally, after 21 years, advancement in DNA technology would crack the case wide open and eventually lead investigators to an offender who was already known by the police. Hello, and welcome back to Mystery Detective. Please support my channel by subscribing and hitting the bell icon for more crime cases. Today's case takes us to Tempe, Arizona. Tempe is popular for being the home of Arizona State University. The city features a pleasant and active lifestyle and a lively downtown with many stores bars, and eateries. Tempe Town Lake is a well-liked destination for pleasure and relaxation. However, despite the calm and fun the city offered, in 1978, a crazed criminal was out attacking young women. A few of these women got away with their lives, but Deanna Bowduin never had a chance to. Deanna Bowduin was born on the 28th of July, 1956, to Harold and Beulah Bowduin. Her parents, Harold and Beulah, met in high school and both graduated from Arizona State University before getting married and having two daughters named, Leslie and Deanna. Beulah Bowduin taught second grade and Harold was a former employee at Honeywell. As a child growing up in Phoenix, Deanna Bowduin was a honor student who attended Camelback High School after completing her elementary education at Squaw Peak Elementary she participated in the 1974 Phoenix Honors Cotillion as a debutante and finished as the organization's first runner-up for the Debutantes of the Year Academic Award. Deanna was a talented young lady who seemed to have her life figured out. After high school, she gained admission into Arizona State University where she was studying marketing management. Deanna Bowduin was a member of the International Business Honor Society, Beta Gamma Sigma, and she was an honor student. After taking the LSAT and the Foreign Service Officers exams, she was thinking about a career in law, international marketing, or diplomacy. Aside from doing well in school, DNA was a kind-hearted young woman who had opened hands and welcomed everyone. Whether the person was elderly or whether they were little kids, she just seemed to be able to talk and relate to them. Her elder sister, Leslie said, before her demise, in addition to being a certified scuba diver, DNA Bowduin was a talented poet. In her short years on Earth, she had had the opportunity to study abroad in Spain, Mexico, and Belgium. She often kept a private calendars in which she wrote down the birthdays of loved ones and also future plans to go dancing at a nearby disco and a road trip to Guaymas, Mexico. Unfortunately, these plans were never achieved as her dreams and aspirations were tragically cut short on the 7th of January, 1978. On the evening of January 6, 1978, Dina Bowduin visited her family home, where she ultimately had dinner. After dinner, she made a move to start going back to her college apartment when her parents requested for her to spend the night at home instead. Deanna, however, objected and chose to sleep in her own apartment because she had to report for work at a law firm the following day. She then left her family home and met up with a friend at a nearby bar. At 12.30 a.m. at midnight, DNA Bowduin would be last seen alive, exiting the bar and driving towards her college apartment. Around 2 a.m., DNA Bowduin's boyfriend arrived the apartment and discovered her dead on her bed. In the bedroom, her clothing was messy, a belt was tightly wrapped around her neck, and there were marks on her right wrist, alongside multiple stab wounds. Sadly, Deanna had been stabbed, raped, and strangled to death. She had semen on her underwear and vagina, but it couldn't be definitively linked to any suspect. Her family was devastated with the news and felt they could have convinced her more to stay behind after dinner. Deanna's boyfriend was a suspect on the list of the police, but he was eventually ruled out after series of interrogation. Days after the murder, investigators did all they could to find the culprit, but 
all efforts proved abortive. The murder of DNA Bowdoin remained unsolved for more than 20 years and was labeled a cold case until 23 years later, in 2001, when Tempe police detective Tom Magazzini was using cutting-edge DNA technology to investigate cold cases that had been on the shelves since 1990. While at it, he stumbled upon DNA Bowdoin's cold case and decided to check the case evidence against a brand new national database. It took a while, but a match was established, and the killer of DNA Bowdoin was eventually identified to be Clarence Dixon. The investigators were surprised because the killer was an already known criminal who was serving a life sentence in an Arizona state prison for a 1986 sexual assault conviction. A background check on Clarence Dixon revealed that during his early years, as a member of the Navajo Nation, he was subjected to abuse and had serious health issues. According to medical reports, Dixon was born with a congenital cardiac defect because of insufficient oxygenation. During further investigation, detectives discovered that Clarence Dixon was living across the street from DNA Bowdoin in 1978. Two years before Deanna's murder, in 1976, Clarence Dixon was married and was taking engineering classes as a former student of Arizona State University before dropping out a year later in 1997 due to mental illness. According to court records, Clarence Dixon's problems with alcoholism and drug addiction resulted in his divorce in 1978. Backtrack to 1977, Dixon was arrested and charged for hitting a 15-year-old girl on the head with a pipe. He claimed the young teenager reminded him of his ex-wife. He, however, could not stand trial after psychologists determined that he had schizophrenia. He was then sent to Arizona State Hospital for treatment. Once his competency was restored, Judge Sandra Day O'Connor, who presided over the Maricopa County Superior Court at the time, declared him not guilty by reason of insanity. She then determined that Clarence Dixon needed to be civilly committed to the state hospital because he was so harmful to the community and mentally sick. However, the county attorney's office and courts did not launch commitment proceedings right away and instead freed the prisoner. Their action would eventually result into DNA Bowdoin being brutally killed by Dixon two days later. He didn't stop there. A few months after DNA Bowdoin passed away, Clarence Dixon stabbed another lady in her Tempe residence. He then received a sentence for burglary and knife assault. Six years later, almost immediately after leaving jail, he was given a life sentence for raping a student from Northern Arizona University who was out on a jog. Clarence Dixon was charged for raping and killing DNA Bowdoin. However, a statute of limitations caused the rape charge to be eventually withdrawn. Clarence Dixon was given the death penalty on January 24, 2008 after being found guilty of first-degree murder. During trial, the defense team for Clarence Dixon claimed that he was paranoid schizophrenic, mentally incompetent, and had a history of recurrent hallucinations. This claims, however, were never considered by the jury. In the year 2015, Dixon was deemed legally blind. The state of Arizona stopped all executions in 2014 after Joseph Wood's lethal injection execution went wrong. The state was forced to employ a new lethal injection combination as a result of lawsuits that were filed. The state looked for a new and authorized medication for executions after a protracted search. In the year 2020, the Arizona Department of Corrections spent $1.5 million on 1,000 vials of the drug called pentobarbital. The state also said in 2021 that it had renovated its gas chamber, giving prisoners the choice of being put to death by lethal gas. The state of Arizona declared it was prepared to resume executions in April 2021. Clarence Dixon was among the first two prisoners to be put to death. Dixon was due to be put to death on October 19, 2021. The authorities initially claimed that the lethal injection chemicals they would be using in the execution would expire after 90 days, but then later admitted that they would only be good for 45 days. Following the finding, Arizona attorney 
General Mark Brnovich requested that the Arizona Supreme Court to reschedule the execution date so that it will fall within the time the lethal injections were still effective. On July 12, 2021, the Arizona Supreme Court, however, rejected the motion to expedite the execution and Clarence Dixon's death sentence was put on hold. The following year, in January 2022, General Mark Brnovich requested again that the Arizona Supreme Court establish briefing schedule for the execution of Clarence Dixon. The fatal injection medication had undergone additional testing, and according to Brnovich, they would be effective for at least 90 days. The Arizona Supreme Court then issued an execution warrant for Clarence Dixon on April 5, 2022, setting the date of his execution for May 11, 2022. Dixon was given the option of a fatal injection or a gas execution. He, however, declined to select a method. The state of Arizona declared on April 20 that Dixon would be put to death by lethal injection, the standard procedure for a prisoner who doesn't make a choice. On May 11, 2022, Dixon was put to death by lethal injection, becoming the first person to be executed in Arizona since 2014. At 10.19 a.m., the injection got underway, and at 10.30 a.m., 11 minutes later, he was declared dead. Dixon insisted on his innocence in his closing remarks. 23-year-old Krista Bromlett was residing in a mobile home in New Providence, Tennessee in 1996. New Providence, which was formerly a small railroad community, was taken over by the nearby community of Clarksville. New Providence saw rising crime rates over the ensuing years, including an increase in drug-related offenses and commercial burglaries. Krista Brumlett regrettably fell victim to these problems. Her case remained cold until after 22 years when her killer was finally arrested. Krista Bromlett was born in 1973 in California to Jim Langley and Kim Venable. Krista was renowned for being witty, compassionate, and smart. Despite having a tight-knit relationship with her family, she made the decision to be financially independent and started living alone. She and her mother had shared a home together in Clarksville until in 1995 when her mother moved to Corpus Christi, Texas with Krista's two young children. Krista wanted to stay back because she hoped to finish her GED program in Clarksville. She then lived alone in a mobile home while pursuing her high school equivalency so she could provide a better life for her two kids. Although her family described her as warm and loving, her neighbor thought she was distant. In the afternoon of October 28, 1996, Krista Bramlett's landlord, Jeff Pennington, knocked on the door of her trailer in the Sunnydale Mobile Home Park just off Peachers Mill Road. The landlord wanted to discuss with Krista about a recent fire outbreak that occurred a week before, but she never responded. Jeff, however, later discovered something terrible while attempting to contact Krista. In the living room, he saw the shoeless body of Krista Bromlett laying in the flickering glow of a small colored television. A terrified Jeff Pennington said, then I called the police. Police in Clarksville, Tennessee were looking into several home killings of women at the time of Krista's murder. Police insisted that the murders had nothing to do with this particle case. When Krista passed away, the Montgomery County Medical Examiner performed an autopsy on her and the Clarksville Police Department Crime Scene Unit processed the mobile home, looking for any available evidence to pinpoint the killer. According to the autopsy, Krista Bromlett died by suffocation and a rape kit revealed signs of sexual assault. The forensics sent their DNA findings from the rape kit to the Tennessee Bureau of Investigations lab, who then loaded the data from that kit into CODIS in the hopes of finding a match. About six detectives began the investigation by interviewing between 50 and 60 neighbors in an effort to identify potential witnesses. A neighbor claimed to have seen Krista on the 27th of October, 1996, sitting on her porch as she always did. But Krista had a distant demeanor, and people typically left her alone. Police expected to make an arrest within a week after receiving nearly a dozen tips, but the leads fizzled out. No potential suspects were located, and the years passed without an arrest. 
Detective Michael Ulrey of the Clarksville Police Department did not receive the news he so wanted until after 22 years in February 13, 2019. It happened that the DNA of the suspect from Krista's rape kit had eventually matched a suspect who was located in Phoenix, Arizona. The DNA on Cody's matched to a 48-year-old man named Kenneth Hudspeth. Detective Michael Ulrey stated that Hudspeth hadn't been mentioned in the investigation up to this point, and no one had noticed him. When Detective Ulrey spoke with the suspect in April, he learned that Hudspeth had indeed lived in the Clarksville at the time of Krista's murder and had left the city in December 1997. Hudspeth didn't deny all the facts presented to him. He claimed to be a friend of Krista, and he allegedly acknowledged being the last person to see her alive. Hudspeth was taken into custody and charged with homicide as a result of the DNA evidence and this interview. He was transferred to Tennessee to await trial after waiving extradition. Investigators learned from Hudspeth's arrest records that he had been detained on multiple occasions for offenses like domestic assault and felony assault. He has served time in jails in Texas and Arizona. His DNA should have been in Cody's years ago, but investigators think the evidence chain of custody may have resulted in lost or ruined swabs. Hudspeth asserted that he had previously done drugs with Krista Bramlett while residing in Clarksville's Sunnydale Mobile Home Park. These allegations were refuted by Krista Bramlett's toxicology report, which revealed a low blood alcohol content. When asked if he had sex with her, he initially denied it, but after seeing the autopsy results and the DNA found inside Bramlett and on her bra, he admitted that he had been so high that he couldn't recall whether or not he had sex with her. I was on bad dope. I know her. Did I have sex with her? I mean, I don't remember that. Hudspeth said in the courtroom, I just don't see myself raping and killing this woman. I hope I didn't, he said again. As soon as there was a break in the case, Krista Bromlett's family members were informed. I knew all along that it was just a matter of time. There was never a doubt in out minds that they'd find who had done it, Krista's grandmother said. Finally, after long, painful 22 years, in January 2022, 52-year-old Kenneth Hudspeth was found guilty by the judge and was sentenced to life in prison for the murder of Krista Bromlett. The terrifying thing about this case was that an innocent man almost received a false execution. The mysterious death of Daryl and Johnson was thought to be resolved for the majority of two decades before heartbreakingly resurfacing as a cold case in 2001. 8 a.m. on February 24th, 1982, was a typical day for all school children in Nampa, Idaho. That morning, nine years old Darylyn Johnson was seen walking six blocks from her house to the Lincoln Elementary School, but she unfortunately never made it there. Her disappearance sparked reaction from concerned neighbors and friends who, alongside with her family, came out in mass to search for her in the whole of Nampa. However, the massive search for Darylyn ended three days later when a couple of fishermen found her body near the Snake River in rural Canyon County. According to an autopsy, Darlin had been sexually assaulted and had blunt force trauma to her torso and head. Male DNA and hair were also taken by the police from the crime scene. Almost immediately, 34 years old Charles Fane was arrested in September on suspicion of raping and killing Darylin. A hair sample that Charles Fane voluntarily provided to the police combined with the fact that he lived a block away from the Johnson's family, led to his arrest. Fane denied having any part in the killing of Darlene after being taken into custody, and he also passed the polygraph test. However, despite his denial and him passing the test, he was still accused of killing Darlene Johnson. During his trial, prosecutors hinted at the possibility that a shoe trail discovered close to Darlene's body belonged to Fane. In addition, two informants from the prison said they overheard Fane confessing to the crime. The two informants also got a shorter jail term in return for their testimony. Fane steadfastly maintained his claim that he was innocent, despite the evidence they mounted against him. He claimed that he was 100 miles away from the neighborhood where Darylin was killed. The other witnesses supported his testimony. But the judge did not rule out Fane as a suspect, despite the absence of solid evidence and no reliable witnesses against him. 
Charles Fane's polygraph results were accepted as evidence in court, and the DNA technology available at the time was insufficient to establish Fane's innocence. Fane was found guilty on November 4, 1983, and was given a death sentence in March of the following year. But he was later imprisoned for nearly 20 years. In the year 1991, he was only four days away from being put to death, but surprisingly, his execution date was postponed. It was then acknowledged eight years later, in 1999, when DNA technology was a little more developed, that the hair DNA discovered on Daryl Johnson's body did not actually belong to Fane, but rather to an unidentified man. Fane was then cleared right away. He was discharged from the maximum security facility in Idaho in August 1999. Several years later in 2019, detectives reopened the case and by the next year, they used genetic genealogy to identify David Dalrymple as a suspect. He was 64 years old and his DNA matched the sample discovered at the crime scene. Dalrymple was already serving a life sentence for kidnapping and abusing a child in 2004. He was formally charged for killing Daryl Lynn Johnson in January 2022. He is still being held in prison and could soon receive a second life sentence or the death penalty. Charles Fane, on the other hand, is happy to be out of bars and is glad that the perpetrator has finally been caught. He was given a sum of $1,400,000 to compensate for his wrongful conviction and the 18 years he spent in prison. Fane recently purchased a truck for himself using part of the money he received for his wrongful conviction. One fateful night on July 22, 1957, two young couples were in a parked car at a lover's lane on Van Ness Avenue in Hawthorne, near El Segundo, California. They were doing what was typical of teenagers. All of a sudden, their vigorous petting came to an end when they were accosted by a young man who was pointing a gun at them through the car's window. All the four teenagers in the car were compelled by their attacker to exit the car and form a lineup. The attacker, who was predicted to be in his early 20s, then ordered the terrified couples to remove their clothing after taking their money and jewelry. At that point, the teenagers could tell that the attacker was not a local by his accent, and it was clear he had been drinking. The gunman obviously wanted the teenager's 1949 Ford sedan. Sadly, that wasn't the only thing the 20-something drifter was after. He also sexually attacked one of the girls after tying the hands of three of the victims behind their backs. All four victims anticipated being shot because they could all clearly see their assailant's face. Fortunately, the attacker just sped off in their vehicle. The teenagers were alive, but visibly scared to death. Shortly before 1.30 a.m., the stolen vehicle sped through a red light directly in front of two on-duty police officers on Rosecrans Avenue and Sepulveda Boulevard. The officers, Richard Phillips and his partner, Milton Curtis, immediately overtook the sped-up car and forced the driver to come to a stop. The police were not informed of the crimes that the driver had committed since the car had not yet been reported stolen. Officer Richard Phillips prepared to give him a ticket. The perpetrator ought to have simply accepted the summons and left. Instead, when Officer Phillips turned his back, the driver fired three shots at him with the same gun he had used to rob the teenagers. Before Officer Curtis could bring out his firearm, the perpetrator fired another round of three shots through the window of the patrol car where he sat, striking him. The criminal then left the area, but not before Officer Phillips was able to shoot the fleeing car three times with his own gun. 28-year-old Officer Richard Phillips and his 25-year-old partner, Officer Milton Curtis, both passed away before the ambulance Officer Phillips had called for could arrive. Officer Richard Phillips had served with the El Segundo Police Department for two years. He was survived by his wife and three children, while Officer Curtis Milton had only served with the El Segundo Police Department for two months. He was survived by his wife, son, and daughter. Both victims' family was inconsolable. Jane, Officer Curtis' wife, could not stop professing how much she loved him. 
According to her, they had a misunderstanding before he left for his work shift. Till today, she regrets not having sorting out their issues and saying goodbye properly. Numerous police officers from across the county turned out to try to find the offender, but it yielded nothing. There was not much evidence at the crime scene. The incidents led to the biggest manhunt in California's history, as the culprit appeared to have vanished into thin air. Later, the stolen car was discovered nearby, abandoned. In the car, the police only discovered two bullets from Officer Phillips' gun, making the police believe that the third bullet likely struck the attacker. A single thumbprint was collected from the steering wheel. This print failed to reveal a culprit for many years. Three years after the murder, in 1960, Joe Tooley, the owner of Manhattan Beach, a residence close to the crime scene, went to the police station to submit two watches and a 22 caliber revolver he discovered while cleaning his property. It was discovered that the watches belonged to the teenagers who were robbed in 1957, and the revolver was the murder weapon. That night, in 1957, the attacker is believed to have dropped those things while leaving the stolen car behind. These pieces of evidence discovered provided a vital lead. The serial number of the revolver led police to a Sears in Shreveport, Louisiana, where G.D. Wilson was documented as the buyer's name. The gun, which was the cheapest one the shop sold, cost $29.95. Investigators found that George D. Wilson had rented a room at AYMCA close to the Sears store but had provided a false Florida address. Police investigated every George D. Wilson they could find for years, but nothing came up. Many years later, in 2002, a certain woman reported to the El Segundo police that her dead uncle had once boasted of killing two police officers. Although the claim was a dead end, it reignited interest in the police officer's cold case. The fingerprint from the teenager's stolen car in 1957 was examined by investigators using the recently released automated fingerprint identification system. Surprisingly, there was a match to a man named Gerald Fighton Mason, who was found guilty of burglary in Columbia in 1956. Due to that incident, he had to serve a one-year term in prison. In addition to matching fingerprints, the evidence also included identical handwriting, which connected him to the murder weapon he used to kill the police officers in 1957. Handwriting analyst Paul Edholm determined that the signatures he had on the IMCA receipt and Sears documents in 1957 were identical to the handwriting on his 1999 South Carolina driver's license application and on a bill of sale for a car. It hadn't changed at all. This was another glaring evidence for the investigators to get to the root of the matter. After the murders, Gerald Mason was a law-abiding citizen for 45 years, never receiving even a parking ticket. He was a wealthy retiree. He was married, had two daughters and six grandchildren. He lived quietly in a suburban area with his family. He owned two gas stations. Friends and neighbors regarded him as being amiable and helpful. Without even the slightest regret for the officer's family, who had lost their loved ones so long ago, Gerald Mason was able to enjoy a long and successful life. In the long run, friends and relatives were horrified to learn that he had committed such a heinous murder. On January 26, 2003, the police who had been watching Gerald Mason for weeks and had seen him playing golf with friends and engaging in other benign pastimes eventually knocked on his door. Gerald Mason was said to have been shocked and asked them where they were from. The police officers introduced themselves and told him that they were there because of the murders of two police officers in 1957. A horrified Gerald Mason responded with, My God, you're here for that. That happened so long ago. I can't believe you're here bothering me with that. Gerald Mason's scar from a bullet graze wound caused by a gunshot fired by Officer Phillips in 1957 was used to further identify him as the culprit after his arrest. Following Mason's arrest that January, 
Officers executed a search warrant at his Columbia house and discovered another unique 9-shot 22 revolver similar to the murder weapon. Investigators also discovered three witnesses who recognized Gerald Mason as the man they had seen the night of the murders based on a photograph taken in 1956. Due to the overwhelming amount of evidence, Gerald Mason confessed to the cops that he had been drinking when he came upon the teenagers. Then, in an effort to hide the rape, robbery, and car theft, he shot both police officers. I really don't have an explanation for why this happened. I wish I did, Gerald Mason said. When asked about the teenager he had raped, Gerald Mason said he no longer remembered the reason why he had raped the 15-year-old girl. Following his arrest, Jerry Mason Whitaker, Gerald Mason's daughter, said in an interview, There really aren't words to describe the range of emotions we've gone through. I could not have had a better father. Gerald Mason professed his regrets to the families of officers Phillips and Curtis during his sentence hearing. It's impossible to express to so many people how sorry I am. I do not understand why I did this. It does not fit in my life. It is not the person I know. I detest these crimes, he said. The surviving families of the victims did not feel any iota of sympathy for Gerald Mason as they pour out their pains in court. Your cowardly act shattered our lives forever. You caused our mother to become a widow with three babies to raise alone, said Carolyn Phillips, Officer Richard Phillips' daughter. The other slain officer's son, Keith Curtis, claimed outside of court that Gerald Mason's in-court apology had not touched him. Mr. Mason is sorry now, and we heard his apology speech. He wasn't sorry for 45 years, and the only reason we're hearing that apology now is because he got caught, Keith Curtis said. Gerald Mason was given two consecutive life sentences with a minimum of seven years after entering a guilty plea. As part of the agreement, the rape, robbery, and grand theft charges were dropped, sparing Mason's family from hearing about how he had raped a teenage girl, as well as the living victims from having to testify. Gerald Mason's application for parole was denied in 2009. He won't have to appear in front of the panel again for a maximum of 15 years, until March 2024, when he will be 90 years old. Prosecutors in California were adamant that he would never be freed. His plea agreement allowed him to serve his prison term close to his family. Thus, he was detained in South Carolina. However, on January 22, 2017, nine days before his 83rd birthday, Mason passed away in prison. He had served 14 years behind bars. His next parole hearing was seven years away. A 29-year-old mother of two named Mary Mathis Davis vanished without a trace in Lexington on the 30th of May, 1987. The news of her disappearance devastated her family and friends. The following day, her body was discovered behind a nearby supermarket, and the discovery shocked the neighborhood. Despite the police department's best efforts, the case remained unsolved for more than 30 years before a breakthrough in 2023. This case takes us to the city of Lexington in North Carolina. The city of Lexington has a rich and diverse cultural heritage and its well-known barbecue has earned it the title barbecue capital of the world. Beyond its delectable cuisine, Lexington has a charming downtown populated with interesting stores and eateries that reflect the city's warm and welcoming nature. Popular with tourists, the city's historic uptown Lexington neighborhood has beautifully preserved early 19th century buildings. On February 12, 1958, Mary Mathis Davis was born in Lexington, although little is known about her early years. She had a sister named Lisa Hinkle, whom she grew up with. Mary and Lisa had a tight-knit bond in such a way that nothing could separate the both of them. Lisa described her sister as a lovely, compassionate person who never failed to brighten up a room with her contagious smile. Mary was also said to have had a talent for putting people at ease. When the two came of age, Mary got to meet a man named Richard Davis. A spark began to develop between them as they got to know one another, and before they knew it, 
they were engulfed in a passionate relationship. As their relationship progresses, Richard Davis knew he wanted to spend the rest of his life with Mary. Mary was overcome with joy when he one day suddenly asked her to be his wife. Without hesitating, she said yes to his proposal. Following the proposal, Mary and Richard started to eagerly make plans for their future as a couple. They talked for hours on end about what their future held, sharing their goals and aspirations for the life they were about to begin. The big day quickly approached, and the couple exchanged vows in a charming and private ceremony. Following the wedding ceremony, Mary and Richard began a new chapter in their lives and eagerly anticipated the journey that lay ahead. The years passed quickly, and Mary and Richard soon had two lovely children. The first child was a boy, and the second, Tracy, was a girl. Mary's heart brimmed with love, and she cherished every second she had with her kids. Later on, she accepted a position at Lexington's Lanier's Ace Hardware Store in order to support her expanding family. Mary didn't mind the fact that the work wasn't the most glamorous. She was appreciative of the chance to generate a consistent income. Even though Mary didn't make much money, it was still enough to pay the bills and put food on the table. Mary was determined to give her family the best life she could, despite the difficulties that came with balancing the demands of motherhood and working a job. Life went on at a good pace as the days turned into weeks, then weeks into months. Mary's family was doing well, and she was happy inside, but tragedy was lurking around the corner, ready to strike whenever anyone least expected it. On May 30, 1987, Mary left her house as usual to go to work. Though it seemed like any other Saturday, she had no idea that it would be her last day on earth. When Mary got to work, she smiled and said hello to her colleagues before starting her day. She eagerly got started on her task. But as the hours passed, she noticed that she was growing hungry and restless. By noon, her tummy was grumbling and she painstakingly waited for lunchtime. When the time finally came, she was relieved to have the opportunity to leave the four walls of her workplace. She anticipated treating herself to a nice meal. She checked her purse to see if she had enough cash to get herself lunch, and when she was certain she did, she left her store and went to a nearby restaurant. No one would ever again see Mary alive after this. She didn't go back to work again. Once her lunch break was over, her absence became more obvious with each second that went by. Her coworkers couldn't help but wonder what was taking her so long. Their confusion changed into worry as the minutes felt like hours. They knew they needed to find her quickly because there were no indications of her return. One of them offered without hesitation to look for her at the eatery where she went to have lunch. The co-worker hurried to the eatery as her heart was racing, but Mary was not there. The staff at the restaurant was of no assistance either, and the situation was getting worse. When the co-worker went back to the hardware store, she reported that she could not find Mary at the eatery. As soon as they heard this, the hardware store employees started to feel afraid and realized they needed to act more seriously. They picked up the phone and dialed the emergency number without delaying further. After providing details of what had happened, the police arrived almost immediately. The co-workers also called Mary's husband and parents in order to inform them of what was happening. Police started looking for Mary right away that day, but at first they found nothing. She was completely absent from sight. As words of her disappearance spread, a sense of fear and uncertainty overcame the neighborhood. On the other hand, Mary's family was left to struggle through the pain of not knowing where she was or what had happened to her. But they hoped and prayed that their dear Mary would be found alive and well. That night, Richard had a hard time falling asleep. His thoughts kept him up at night. He had a gut feeling that a serious problem had befallen his family. He realized that Mary's disappearance was not a straightforward case of getting lost in the city because it did not make sense to him. His mind wanders to their kids and how he would look them in the face the following day. Unaware of the potential danger to their mother, the innocent kids had been asking Richard of their mother. The idea of breaking the news to them that she might never return again was too painful for Richard to bear. 
but he was aware that he needed to be there for his kids all the way. The next morning, as the sun rose, the search for Mary persisted, but it seemed like all the efforts were in vain. Mary's family and the police were anxiously searching for any information about her sudden disappearance. As the day wore on, the police abruptly received a call reporting the discovery of a dead body behind the building of a nearby supermarket called Winn-Dixie. After the call, a small group of police officers rushed to the scene right away. After seeing a small crowd forming around the body's discovery, the police officers moved in to quickly secure the area. The body had clearly been there for some time, as they could see. It was already starting to emit a slight odor of decay. They were able to recognize the body as belonging to Mary Mathis Davis after closer examination. The officers' faces showed shock and disbelief, but they also knew they needed to get to the root of the investigation. There was no immediate indication of the cause of death. So the police started looking around right away for any possible clues. They also questioned the supermarket staff, but none of them appeared to be particularly knowledgeable about what had happened to the victim. The body was then removed for an autopsy after that. One of the policemen showed up at Mary's family's house the day her body was discovered. As the atmosphere was tensed, the officer broke the heartbreaking news to her family. He offered his condolences and shared what little information they had about Mary's incident. The news was indeed a tragic one as Mary's family was left broken and inconsolable. After a few days, Mary's autopsy results came out and it was discovered that she was strangled to death. It was also found out that she had experienced sexual assault. As a result of this, Mary's death was classified as a homicide. The authorities started looking into Mary's death as her family was left to mourn and stay strong. The investigators were determined to find the answers to the many unanswered questions they had. Investigators had DNA samples that had been gathered from the crime scene as pieces of evidence. Though, there wasn't much that could be done with this, due to the lack of advanced DNA technology at the time. Regardless of this shortcoming, detectives diligently pursued every lead and tip that came their way, working day and night. At a point, they appealed to the general public for assistance, with the hope that someone would come forward with information that would help solve the mystery behind the case, but all efforts proved abortive. The detectives felt defeated because it appeared as though the murderer had vanished from the face of the earth. As the days dragged on, becoming weeks and then months, the murderer seemed to have eluded capture. However, Mary's family never lost hope and held on to the belief that justice would eventually be served no matter how long it took. They made an effort to move on with their lives, but the scars from their loss never completely healed. Nearly 25 years after Mary's murder, Lisa, her sister, came out and spoke to the media about the tragedy and pain that she had her family members had to go through when Mary was snatched from them. She spoke candidly to the press about the pain they had experienced and how difficult life had been without her cherished sister by her side. The family had never given up hope that they would one day find the closure they so desperately sought as Lisa reflected on the happy times they spent together with Mary. Despite the pain and loss, she revealed that the family was not interested in exacting revenge and that she was prepared to offer Mary's killer forgiveness. A new group of detectives working on Mary's murder case in 2022 made the decision to examine the evidence at hand. They had knowledge about the developments in DNA technology and were confident that, compared to 1987, they now stood a better chance of cracking the case. After that, the detectives then delivered some tangible evidence to the North Carolina State Crime Lab. The North Carolina Bureau of Investigation was contacted to look into the case based on the encouraging results of the analysis of the evidence. From that point on, things accelerated. The Texas-based private forensic genealogy laboratory called Othram was contacted by the State Bureau of Investigation. DNA piece of evidence was then sent to Othram, where scientists were able to create a genealogical profile for potential suspects. The unidentified male suspect was finally identified after months of diligent work. 
Russell Grant Woods was the name given as the murderer of Mary Mathis Davis. The detectives felt relieved after making the discovery because they were certain that the case had been solved. There was a problem, though. There was no way to bring the murderer to justice because, according to a background check, he had passed away in 2013 at the age of 58. Russell Grant Wood had previously been named as a suspect in the case, but detectives were forced to focus their attention elsewhere at the time due to a lack of sufficient evidence. Not only that, it was however learned that Mary and Russell Grant Wood had known each other before her death, although it is unclear what kind of relationship they had. If Russell Grant Wood had still been alive, the state would have moved forward with indictments and accused him of first-degree rape, kidnapping, and murder. Mary's surviving family learned of the case's breakthrough on February 3, 2023. They thanked the detectives for their commitment to the investigation. We prayed that one day we will find the person who violently murdered our beloved Mary. We now have some answers. Although that won't bring Mary back, it does give us a sense of closure. Lori Martin, Mary's niece, told the press. On February 12, 2023, Mary's family held a memorial celebration at Forest Hill Memorial Park in Mary's honor. If she was still alive, that day would have marked her 65th birthday. Mary was a light in this world, and we were blessed to have her as long as we did. She was a loving mother, wife, sister, and friend. We know she is resting easily in the arms of our Lord and Savior, Lori Martin said. There are still many questions that we will never have the answers to, even though the mystery surrounding Mary's death has been solved and the murderer has been found. What sort of connection do you think Mary and Russell had? Post your ideas in the comments section to share with us. A disturbing discovery was made in Colorado's South St. Rain Canyon on June 4, 2006. Not far from Lyons, a decomposing body was discovered by hikers. The scene created an enigmatic image. It appears as though the woman's body was pulled from a shallow grave, probably by a feral animal, a sleeping bag, a pillow in its case, and a pair of yellow ski pants were all carefully folded nearby. Her fingerprints could not be used to identify her due to her state of decomposition. Only one clue, which was a single cross ring, was discovered with her. Who was this woman? And what terrible circumstances might have resulted in her demise? Hello and welcome back to Mystery Detective, where we delves into sinister mysteries pertaining to both resolved and unresolved cases worldwide. Colorado's Boulder County is home to a diversified population that flourishes in the area's scenic beauty. The area is well known for combining historic and recreational sites, providing people with a well-rounded way of life. Living here means taking advantage of outdoor pursuits, such as hiking trails and historic sites. The neighborhood is renowned for its unity and is friendly and inviting. Boulder County does not, however, come without difficulties, just like many other places. Although generally low, there have been some dark periods in the crime rate. The June 4, 2006, Angela Wild cold case is one instance of such an incident. This case was an enigma that went unsolved for more than 10 years. A group of hikers decided to explore the beautiful trails close to Lyons in the South St. Vrain Canyon of Colorado on a seemingly ordinary day on June 4, 2006. They had no idea that their journey would result in a finding that would confound the locals and the police for years to come. They came upon a grisly sight as they continued their journey down the canyon. A decaying body not far from the trail was spotted. The bleak reality of what was ahead of them abruptly eclipsed the canyon's serene beauty. The hikers promptly notified the authorities, who promptly arrived to conduct an investigation. After a more thorough investigation, deputies and investigators concluded that the remains belonged to a female. The way the body was positioned and the surrounding evidence pointed to it having been buried in a shallow grave at first. 
and then discovered by a wild animal that was probably attracted to the smell. Personal items such as a sleeping bag, pillow and matching pillowcase, and a pair of yellow ski pants were arranged neatly not far from the grave. These objects, which didn't appear to have been damaged by the weather, created a spooky image of the woman's last moments. For the investigators, this advanced state of decomposition presented a major challenge. Conventional identification techniques, like fingerprint analysis, were ineffective. A cross ring discovered with the body was the only item that could have provided a hint as to who the woman was. This jewelry, which might have sentimental significance, turned into the center of the inquiry. Seeking to learn the truth, the sheriff's office made contact with the coroner's office to request assistance. It was challenging to determine the precise cause of death, though, due to the state of the body. Even though there were no obvious injuries, such as gunshot wounds, stab wounds, or broken bones, foul play was a strong possibility. In light of the condition of the remains, the coroner was unable to rule out more heinous methods, such as strangulation, even in the absence of such injuries. The discovery of a white, powdery substance on the body and surrounding the grave added to the mystery. This white, powdery substance was determined by lab testing to be calcium oxide, also referred to as quicklime. When it comes into contact with moisture, this substance produces heat and causes decomposition more quickly. This quick lime, which weighed about 50 pounds, covered the body of the victim and penetrated the ground surrounding the grave about 14 inches down. Its presence indicated an intentional act and suggested a deliberate attempt to accelerate the body decomposition process. The shallow grave, the well-folded items, and the application of quick lime all suggested a hurried attempt to hide the crime. Even though the body showed evidence of animal predation, the case was made even more confusing by the absence of any other obvious injuries. There were a lot of unanswered questions in the community. They wondered who the woman was and who would want to hurt her. The Boulder County Sheriff's Office moves quickly after learning of the body's location. Aware of the seriousness of the situation, and the demand for public support. They made contact and asked anyone who had information to come forward. The reaction was tremendous. Numerous tips were received, many of which pointed to missing women from across the nation. The overwhelming amount of these tips created a dismal image, emphasizing the concerning number of missing women nationwide as well as in the metro area. Devoted Boulder County Sheriff's Officer Jason Okers thought back on the emotional cost of the investigation. He talked about the heartbreaking reality of thousands of women going missing and the suffering their families went through while they searched for answers. Every tip could lead to something, a potential resolution to a family's worst fear. Every name was thoroughly investigated by the sheriff's office, leaving no detail unexplored. To help with their investigation, the sheriff's office worked with other agencies. They made use of resources from the Colorado Bureau Investigation, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, and the National Missing and Unidentified Person System. The group's goal was to cross-reference information and reduce the number of possible identities for the victim. Luckily, a breakthrough occurred in October of 2006. A woman brought her alarming report to the attention of the Longmont Police Department. It had been a while since she'd seen her friend, whom she called Angela Wiles. Her account of Angela's death was remarkably similar to the corpse discovered in the canyon. She even mentioned a unique crane that matched the cross ring discovered with the remains and that Angela frequently wore. Investigators looked further into Angela Wiles' past using this lead. They learned that Angela was from the Longmont community. The friend's physical description matched the features of the body, confirming the possible match even more. Science was called upon by the sheriff's office to verify the identity. 
They carried out a DNA analysis in November of 2006. In order to obtain conclusive evidence, they compared samples from four Angela Wilde's sisters with rib bones found in her remains. The outcomes were definitive. It is confirmed that the 38-year-old body discovered in the South St. Vrain Canyon belongs to Angela Wilde's of the Longmont, Colorado area. On February 28, 1968, Angela Josephine Wilde's better known as Angela J. Garcia was born. There is no denying the lasting impression she made on everyone who knew her, even though the precise location of her birth and the identities of her parents are still a mystery. The address that Angela called home was 214 East 8th Avenue in Longmont, Colorado. Tammy Benson, one of her sisters, at last recalled Angela. She described Angela as a beacon of love and kindness, someone who had the natural ability to brighten any space with her warmth and sincere concern for other people. Her family wasn't the only ones who had these feelings. Her laughter was contagious, and her generosity were often mentioned by her Longmont neighbors and friends. Like all of us, Angela had passions, dreams, and aspirations. She was distinctive in her own right, with peculiar hobbies and traits. She clearly had a contagious zest for life, even though the details of her passion were kept private. She was a firm believer in living in the now, seizing each opportunity, and sharing love with everyone she met. Angela led a nomadic lifestyle without a fixed address or a regular job. Rather, she depended on the generosity of friends, frequently taking shelter on their couches. Because of her nomadic lifestyle, investigators had a difficult time piecing together her final days. Life is unpredictable. Nobody in Longmont could have predicted the tragic course of events that June of 2006, especially her loved ones. At the age of 38, Angela passed away suddenly. In order to learn more about Angela's life, detectives spoke with a wide range of her acquaintances, family, and friends. Still, there was mystery surrounding her last days. The identification of Angela's ski pants through DNA analysis at the crime scene provided a crucial lead. There was, however, more. Additionally, the same ski pants contained DNA from an unidentified male. Three years after her remains were discovered, on January 22, 2009, another noteworthy event took place. Using DNA evidence, the Colorado Bureau of Investigation connected a man known as John Anger to the crime scene. Investigators started looking into any possible connection between Anger and Angela after receiving this lead. When they asked around, they learned that a number of people had seen the two together in late 2005 and early 2006. Detectives in Anchorage, Alaska, located Anger and conducted an interview with him in August 2009. He talked about his early 2006 travels and mentioned that he had gone to a dive school in Texas, after which he spent some time residing in Colorado, in cities like Longmont, Canyon City, and Monte Vista. Shortly after, he moved to Alaska by August. When Anger was asked about Angela Wilde and shown her photo, he denied ever knowing anything about her. In a follow-up interview with the Boulder County Sheriff's Office in September, he restated this position once more, even refuting any knowledge of the South St. Vrain neighborhood where Angela's body was found. However, family members claimed Anger frequently visited a cave in the South St. Vrain area, refuting his claims. He used to camp and hike near this cave, which is only a few miles from Lyons. His sister even related an incident in which she dropped him off right next to the site where Angela's bones would eventually be discovered. Anger's buckle swab was obtained and it was compared to the DNA discovered at the crime scene in order to confirm the link. The outcomes were instructive. 
The main profile inside the sleeping bag and on the pillowcase was Anger's DNA. Born on July 28, 1969, John Michael Anger is still a mysterious figure in the cold case of Angela Wilde. As of 2023, Anger is clearly more than just a name in a case file. Even though specifics about his early life, like his parents' names and place of birth, are still unknown. Even though the public hasn't been privy to much of Angera's personal history, such as his upbringing, education, and family life, it's important to keep in mind that he wasn't an isolated individual. His actions were probably influenced by a variety of personal struggles and experiences, especially those that preceded his involvement in Angela Wilde's case. Regarding his criminal past, Details of any crimes he may have committed in the past are unknown. In 2010, an arrest warrant for Anger was prepared, marking the start of the investigation. He was being held in an Alaskan prison at the time for violating his probation. The Fort Collins, Colorado stated that following a preliminary hearing in July 2010, a judge dismissed the case in spite of the growing body of evidence. The reason is that there isn't enough proof to link Anger specifically to the crime. But when multiple acquaintances described Anger's volatile nature, the story took a turn. Some even reported disturbing stories about him attempting to strangle his ex-girlfriends. He seemed to become extremely angry at the name Angela. After reviewing the case in 2015, a pathologist concluded that asphyxiation was most likely the cause of Angela's death given the circumstances. The disclosure took on even greater significance in light of Anger's purported history of strangulation. When we fast forward to 2023, the story takes on yet another turn. Anger's ex-girlfriend, who had earlier denied any violent behavior from him, disclosed that Anger had choked her several times while they were dating. This information, along with other evidence and witness statements, painted a disturbing picture of Anger's involvement. Anger and Angela were both identified by witnesses as being at the Bar El Motel in Longmont, Colorado, at the time of the crime. Another piece of the puzzle was added when the motel records confirmed their stay. Authorities presented their findings to a grand jury in February 2023 based on this growing body of evidence. On March 9, 2023, John Inger was indicted. This was a turning point after many years. 53-year-old John Michael Anger was taken into custody in Anchorage, Alaska, in relation to the case of Angela Josephine Wilde. The investigation of Angela Wilde's cold case has required tenacity, fortitude, and an unwavering pursuit of justice. As he considered the development, Boulder County Sheriff Curtis Johnson said, I'm happy that we were able to advance our investigation into Angela Wilde's case. I'm really proud of our detectives because they didn't give up on this unsolved case. Angela's family has been looking forward to this day. And as we move forward, they continue to be in our efforts. The way the case has developed has given Angela's family hope and created new research opportunities. The question of whether John Anger was involved in any other unsolved crimes in Alaska and Colorado is still being investigated. Anyone with information about this case is encouraged to come forward by the authorities. The Boulder County Sheriff's Office's Detective Mike McKinley can be reached at 303-441-4692. Angela's sister, Tammy Benson, has been a rock of strength during this whole ordeal. She expressed her hopes for the upcoming trials, saying, I hope this time, the courts, the judge, and everyone involved truly listens. He needs to take responsibility for his actions now. Tammy remembers Angela as a kind and loving person, and her memories of her sister are warm and fuzzy. The decision to charge Anger again for the second time was a big deal. Tammy felt like the prosecutors had finally heard her pleas. What are your thoughts on this case? 
Tell us what you think by leaving a comment. Laura Ann Huizar was born on the 10th of May, 1972, to Judy Marie Huizar and Jose Luis Huizar. She was a sixth grader at Chester, a Moore Elementary School, and was just 11 years old when she was kidnapped, sexually assaulted, and then brutally killed. Laura vanished on a Sunday afternoon at around 1.30 p.m. on November 6, 1983, as she was making her way home from a friend's house in St. Lucie County, Central Florida. She was last seen at 2G's Market. She had been sleeping over at a friend's house and was walking home with an armful of clothes. When her parents realized that she hadn't returned home, they contacted the friend she had been with and were told that she had left hours ago. Her parents feared the worst. It was unlike Laura to stay on the streets for long. They searched the area, and when they could not find her, they made their way to the St. Lucie County Sheriff's Office to report their daughter missing. At the time, officers did not take the little girl's disappearance seriously because, to them, adolescents who do not return home on time are often playing with their friends and have simply lost track of time. Back then, authorities generally did not take reports of missing adolescents seriously until they had been missing for a longer period of time. A massive search was never carried out for Laura, but authorities put up a bolo sheet. Not long, James Howard Harrison, a deputy from the St. Lucie County Sheriff's Office, came forward and claimed to have seen the little girl walking close to a gas station. It appeared that on the day Laura disappeared, James Howard Harrison was out on patrol. He stated the approximate time he last saw her before claiming to have carried on with his patrol. Although Laura Ann Huizar had a small stature for her age, she was feisty and outspoken. Her family claimed she was very street smart and would never have gotten into a car with a stranger. Three days after she vanished, on the 9th of November, 1983, two men discovered Laura Ann's body in a drainage ditch less than 600 yards from the gas station where she was last seen. Her body was sent for an autopsy right away and asphyxiation was determined to be the cause of her death. She had been raped before being strangled to death. The authorities opened an investigation into the murder case, but they were unable to assemble any tangible proof from the crime scene. After the perpetrator murdered Laura Ann, he then changed the crime scene by putting the body in a drainage ditch to get rid of all the physical evidence. The murderer's actions suggested that he had prior experience handling evidence and crimes. On Laura's body, the police discovered male DNA traces. Since there was no one to match the DNA with at the time, it was kept in a sexual assault kit. The criminal database and DNA technology weren't developed enough back then to give the police any leads about the murderer. The St. Lucie County Police Department's files on Laura Ann's murder case eventually became cold. The St. Lucie County Sheriff's Office created a special cold case squad in 2020, and the team decided to re-examine Laura Ann's case. The investigation was being led by Detective Paul Taylor. The initial investigation had a lot of gaps, which were quickly identified. One of the men who had initially found Laura's body was interviewed by Detective Paul Taylor, who was surprised to be the only officer other than Deputy James Howard Harrison to speak with him. The man remembered that day and the crime scene clearly because according to him, it had been a terribly traumatic discovery. I see that little girl lying there every time I close my eyes. The man said, he went on to give Detective Paul Taylor a detailed account of what he had seen that day, but the detective was shocked to learn that his account didn't match the information in Laura Ann's file. I had already been through the crime scene photos, the case file, and what they're telling me does not match what I'm seeing, said Detective Paul Taylor. He discovered through questioning the witnesses that one of their own deputies had turned the witnesses away and then moved Laura's body away from the initial crime scene. According to the witness, when they called the police to report the discovery of Laura Ann's body, Detective James Howard Harrison was the first officer to arrive at the crime scene. The man claimed that after taking his short statements from them, Harrison sent them away. Since then, 
They were never contacted by anyone from the St. Lucie County Sheriff's Office regarding the case. It was discovered that, before other officers arrived, Harrison spent 20 minutes by himself at the crime scene. The investigation was quick, no suspects were ever named, and the case was promptly filed away for almost 40 years. After hearing this testimony, Detective Paul Taylor decided to take a closer look at Deputy Harrison's background for the first time, and what he discovered was heartbreaking. In February 2022, James Howard Harrison, a former deputy sheriff for the Lucy County Sheriff's Office, was identified by Detective Paul Taylor as the primary and sole suspect in the murder of 11-year-old Laura Ann Huizar. Since the 1960s, Harrison has served as a pastor and worked in 10 different law enforcement organizations. He was the last person to see Laura alive. He kidnapped her when she was walking home, sexually assaulted her, then killed her and dumped her body in a drainage ditch. It was discovered that Harrison was fired from the sheriff's office five months after Laura was murdered. At the time, he had been accused of sexually assaulting several young girls in his church. Co-workers at the sheriff's office had also complained about Harrison because they believed he had behaved inappropriately around young girls while performing his duties as a deputy. I'm actually standing there in front of this victim's family and I'm telling them that one of our deputies is the one who did it. It's rough, a shock detective Taylor said. Unfortunately, Harrison passed away before the police could arrest him for the rape and murder of Laura Ann. He had died of cancer in 2008, but in the year 2020, the investigators obtained a warrant to exhume his body from the cemetery so that a DNA sample could be taken. However, by that time, the DNA from Laura's crime scene had deteriorated too much to match the sample taken from Harrison's body. However, they are certain that Laura Ann Huizar's murder was committed by former Deputy James Howard Harrison. The St. Lucie County Sheriff's Office has stated that they are certain that Harrison killed Laura Ann based on witnesses' accounts, evidence tampering, and a history of sexual assaults on young girls. Due to his inappropriate behavior with young adults, Detective Taylor claimed that Harrison was forced to resign from both his church and the St. Lucie County Sheriff's Office five months after the murder of Laura Ann Huizar. Investigators entered Harrison's DNA into national and state databases. In order to ascertain how many more victims he had, his DNA is currently being tested in a number of Florida cold cases. After the Laura Ann Huizar cold case was formally closed, her older brother Joe was in total disbelief that his sister's killer could finally be revealed. It naturally was like a disbelief, a dream, after all this time. You're telling me you're able to tell us who murdered our little sister? Joe said. The Huizar family expressed their gratitude for Detective Paul Taylor's tireless efforts in solving this case, but they expressed their disappointment with what they perceived to be a poor quality investigation at the time Laura was killed. They also expressed their desire to question all the detectives who were on the case in 1983. From our perspective, things were purposefully overlooked and not done. There were such humongous gaps in the investigation, said the Hugh is our family. What do you think, guys? Did the former deputy abuse children throughout his entire life while serving as a deputy sheriff and holding a position of authority in the community as a preacher? How can we protect our women from these powerful men who take advantage of the systems and laws to further their own evil goals? Please share your opinions in the comment section below.